It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, back on May 24th, the Premier announced uh, that uh, people should line up for asymptomatic testing of COVID-19. And in fact, this is opposite from the advice that he was being given by experts, including his own chief medical officer of health, and we all recall uh, the results. Uh, we, we saw what happened. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, the, the Premier's own minister uh, was uh, on the side of the experts and uh, pretty concerned by the sounds of it, uh, because at the commission, uh, here's what she said, at the commission into long-term care, the minister of health said, uh, in distancing herself from this decision, quote, I would say that this was something that was very important to the Premier and that you would really need to speak to him about that. So, Minister of Health and at least three of the government's top experts all, you know, dis all were advising the Premier against question. massive asymptomatic testing. So the question is, why did the Premier ignore the expert advice, ignore his own minister, and claim he was acting on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, and in fact he was doing the opposite? Minister of Health for a friend. Thank you. Well, I can certainly say at the time we were very concerned about community transmission. We were concerned about community transmission, which was then finding its way into our long term care homes because there were people coming in, essential visitors, sometimes staff who were asymptomatic. It was something that was concerned to the Premier, it was concerned to me, it was a concern to the Minister of Long Term Care, it was a concern to everyone. And so, as a, mat a precautionary matter, the Premier felt very concerned that we do something and start doing that asymptomatic testing so that we could stop that eight community transmission, but especially that transmission that was going into long-term care homes. The supplementary well, question. Speaker, we all know that the consequences of this, uh, of this decision of the Premier's, uh, which was contrary to the advice he was being given, uh, were serious. Uh, our lab system became overwhelmed. People could not get the test results at, uh, adequately or quickly enough in long-term care, which cost folks their lives. There were lineups. We remember those pictures. Lineups of families with children, sometimes for hours and hours and hours on end to get those tests. It was a debacle. So I, I guess my question is to the Premier, why did he suggest that he was taking the best advice necessary to save lives when, in fact, he knew he was ignoring the best advice? Minister of Health. In fact, that was not the case at all. As we were increasing the testing, we were also increasing the lab capacity, which, as the member may recall, started at about 3,000 tests on a daily basis through Public Health Ontario and grew to a system where now we are able to process over 100,000 tests in a day. At about that time, we had significantly increased our capacity and built a network in very short order, including hospital labs, university labs, community labs, as well as Public Health Ontario. So as we were increasing the testing, we were ensuring that we also had the lab capacity to be able to deal with that. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, look, it's, it's not just the testing. The Premier uh, ignored or, or, or acted contrary to advice on the testing, as we've just talked about, uh, on the risks uh, in terms of what was happening uh, to vulnerable people in long-term care, uh, on the framework that the government first announced on all of these uh, situ in all of these situations. The Premier did not act on the advice of experts or, in fact, his ministers. In fact, the Minister of Health, again, couldn't defend the Premier and said to the Commission, you really need to speak to the Premier about that regarding uh, the testing. So, look, why did the Premier claim he was acting on expert advice when, in fact, it's very apparent he wasn't? And will he attend the Long-Term Care Commission himself to put that question, uh, to have that question asked? Will he voluntarily go to the Commission and tell everybody why he made those decisions? Minister of Health. In fact, the Premier has indicated and he has followed the recommendations of the Dr. Williams, the Public Health Measures Table, Public Health Ontario, every step of the way from building up our testing capacity, building up our lab capacity, getting the vaccines and setting up the commission that he has with the immunity, uh, the uh, vaccine task force. Every step along the way he's followed the medical advice, which has gotten us to a place, I would indicate, where Ontario right now 
and the actions speak louder than words. Ontario right now stands at 72 cases per 100,000, the lowest in Canada except the Atlantic bubble. So I think that something has been done right. The Premier has followed the expert advice of the medical advisors, and it's serving Ontario well. Thank you. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, nobody in this province believes the loss of 4,000 uh, seniors, vulnerable seniors in long-term care is a victory. So it's shameful that the Premier or that the Minister responds in that way. But look, I want to talk now about the Minister of uh, Long-Term Care, and so my question is to her, Speaker. Uh, the Minister very clearly told the Commission uh, that she knew uh, that there was a problem with uh, access to PPE in long-term care, that she knew that there wasn't enough staffing in long-term care. Uh, in fact, she was very worried, apparently, uh, about what might be happening in long-term care. Uh, and she also knew very clearly that there was no iron ring of protection around long-term care. So my question is, uh, why did the Minister feel it was her role to back up the Premier's claim that there was a long-term uh, iron ring around long-term care uh, when, in fact, she knew that that prote protection did not exist. Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. There is no doubt that our government took every measure and every tool that it possibly could as the science evolved around this virus. And let me be clear, this is the government that is addressing the systemic issues that have faced long-term care for decades. It is this government Order. that has approved $1.38 billion in surge funding to the sector, and it is this Conservative government that put forward a $1.9 billion staffing plan that will hire 27,000 new staff. And it is this government that announced a training support program for an additional 8,200 Dependent staff. members come to order. It is this government that is raising the daily average of, of direct care to four hours. And it is this government that is building 15,000 new beds Response. and re redeveloping another 15,000. I urge the opposition to support us. Join Team Ontario as we rebuild long. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, it is this government that failed to learn the most important lesson from SARS, and that is the precautionary principle. This minister should have been paying attention to what was happening in long-term care. No one should die when we're waiting for evidence. That's what the SARS lesson was. While we're waiting for the evidence, if we think something's happening, we should act quickly and save lives. Yesterday, the minister said uh, that she knew of anecdotal cases and that there was a, a paucity of, of, of research, notwithstanding the fact that she knew that she was worried about what was happening in long-term care. How could this minister, how could this premier, how could this government ignore the most important uh, lesson from the SARS Commission, the precautionary principle. How can that happen, Speaker? Minister, members, to please take their seats. Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker. If the member opposite was uh, was aware at the time, the evidence was still evolving. There was around the world Order. there was different opinions, and that is how science works. Our government is modernizing long-term care. And the opposition continues to play politics and stand in the way. During the second wave, they voted against key stabilization measures like emergency orders that allowed for the redeployment of staff and prevention and containment funding for homes across this province. The Leader of the Opposition herself voted against $10.8 million to date for long-term care homes in Hamilton fighting COVID-19, and she would have denied money to critical PPE, staffing and renovations. And After years of advocacy, the NDP couldn't even support our government's commitment to an average of four hours of daily direct care in the budget. We are zeroed in on Response. modernizing long-term care, and once again, I say to the opposition, join us in being part of the solution. Final supplementary. Speaker, this government and this minister and this premier did not take 
the most important lesson from SARS. You don't wait for the evolution of a crisis where thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people die because you didn't bother to get ahead of it and take the lessons that you should have taken. But look, this is what Kathy Park said just yesterday. While the minister kept her silence all along, Kathy Park said this yesterday, April 22, 2020, the day we had to bury my father, I speak on national news through unbelievable grief in an attempt to speak out for those who need help. Kathy Parks was not an expert. She wants to know from this minister, imagine what you could have done have you, had you actually spoken up. Imagine. That's what Kathy says. How can it be that the minister who knew that the seniors in long-term care were at risk didn't uh, admit, didn't call the premier on the fact that the iron ring Question. was in fact a hollow promise, and why did she not speak up and save 4,000 lives in long-term care? Members, please take their seat. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And the points made are exactly why we were making every effort on PPE, on testing, uh, surmounting obstacles like the delays that we met uh, with Health Canada being unable to approve rapid tests. These have been ongoing efforts. And you know, when it comes to families, I, I've gone through this with family members. I can only imagine how excruciating this must have been for people. This tragedy that not only was unfolding in Ontario, but across Canada and around the world. And so some good must come from this. And that's exactly why our government is addressing all these areas that were so long neglected and rebuilding and repairing a system that was left to decline in terms of a staffing crisis, in terms of the capacity. We're repairing and rebuilding a long-term care sector that was neglected for decades. The, the capacity issues, the four-bed wardrooms that were left to languish under the previous government and supported by the NDP. Response. We will continue. Order. We will continue to do the important work to address these issues that set the stage for this tragedy, and we will continue with dedication and commitment to address this. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Local public health units have started their own vaccination rollout, but like every single step through this crisis, they have again found themselves on their own and in the dark. Mayors, including from the GTHA, are raising concerns that while they have responsibility for running the Prince province vaccine rollout, they still haven't heard back from this government about the funding that they need to actually get this important work done. When will the Premier let cities, municipalities know if they are going to receive any money whatsoever to do the job that this Premier has left them responsible for? Minister of Health. Thank you, and I thank the member very much for the question. In fact, we have been in regular communication with the local public health units, with the CEOs of the hospitals, with the municipalities as well, with respect to their efforts to assist with the vaccine rollout. The public health units are receiving financial assistance for the work that they're doing, and we've also asked municipalities to help out with areas for mass vaccination clinics like community centres. Uh, and yesterday, we were at U of T, Mississauga campus where they're opening a mass vaccination clinic and, um, and other areas such as arenas. We are working very closely with municipalities and uh, there are discussions going on with respect to all aspects of the clinics that are going to be brought forward. Supplementary. Well, cities and municipalities are telling us that they've already started to spend the money even though they have no idea whether they will be able to pay their bills when everything is said and done. Local public health units are moving heaven and earth to overcome this government too low, too late vaccination plan and actually get shots into people's arm right now. They should not have a plan of vaccination strategy based on cross fingers and hope that the check will show up at some times in the future, maybe if you're lucky. Cities, municipalities need clear answer from the province, and they needed those answers yesterday. What is the government waiting for? When is the gov this government going to get its acts together and finally step up 
with a clear vaccine plan that includes the funding so that cities and municipality needs in order to do their job. Minister Health. Well, in fact, we do have a solid vaccine plan, vaccination plan that involves all 34 public health unit regions as well as the municipalities. Dr. Hillier has been, uh, sorry, General Hillier, has been in uh, regular contact with them. I've been involved in a number of the conversations as well. They're dealing with all aspects, the expenses with the, uh, the clinics, with the organization of the clinics. Some of the public health unit regions have come out in advance of the central booking agency becoming available on March 15th. They're already booking uh, clients to come in to receive their vaccines. They're over 80. In fact, in Guelph, Wellington area, they've already uh, vaccinated over 50 percent of their over 80 population. This is in the context of working within the system that we have. Once our big system comes online on the 15th, it was tested yesterday because we don't want to see it fail as it has in other jurisdictions. We want it to be solid Response. and stand up to the pressure that we know that is going to be coming because people are anxious to know when they're going to be receiving the vaccine. But it is a solid plan. It is rolling out, and we're making sure that people are receiving the vaccines in a timely manner. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier, who is also our Minister of Health. And this is all concerning the vaccine rollout. Deputy Premier, I know that this topic is on the mind of everyone right now. And I am sure that it's the only thing that you can think about as it remains your top priority. Getting the vaccines in the people's arms is the most important task at hand right now. And I know under the leadership of General Hillier, our province is in steady hands as we are implementing a great plan that has ensured that top priority populations are being fully vaccinated. This includes successful vaccination programs administered in our long-term care homes, residents in our retirement homes, vaccinating our frontline health care heroes and Indigenous partners in remote communities. Speaker, can the Deputy Premier please share with my constituents in Chatham-Kent Leamington more information about the vaccine, vaccination rollout and what it means to all Ontarians? Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, yes, thank you very much to the member from Chatham-Kent-Leamington for the question. And I first want to congratulate the member on the great news about the birth of his granddaughter, Shiloh Benat. That is wonderful news. Great congratulations. But the member is correct. The vaccination rollout is our number one priority, and it depends on every member of Team Ontario. I first want to thank the leadership of General Hillier and our frontline heroes. Over 727,000 vaccines have already been administered in the province of Ontario. Our public health units are doing a fantastic job, and there is an overall plan. That's why it was a real privilege yesterday to be at Trillium Health Partners, University of Toronto, Mississauga, and the Region of Peel Clinic yesterday. Clinics like this will play a major part in our vaccine rollout across the province. Order. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, thank you, uh, Deputy Premier, for your kind remarks. Uh, baby Shiloh's doing fine. I almost want to break into a Neil Diamond song, Shiloh, you know. <laughs> However, we are seeing innovation and leadership throughout this province from different public health units. In my region, the Chatham Kent Public Health Unit has begun vaccination appointments for those over 80 years old. Out in Ottawa, people over 80 who are in high-risk neighbourhoods have been able to book vaccination appointments using the city's flu immunization booking system. In Toronto, a pilot program to bring COVID-19 vaccines directly to Toronto seniors living independently is already up and running. And in Guelph, they've begun the process of vaccinating uh, residents over the age of 80 after completing vaccinations for residents and staff at all of the long-term care and retirement homes. As more vaccines come in, we'll put up more mass vaccination centers. So, Speaker, Question. can the Deputy Premier please elaborate to this legislature more about the groundbreaking work being accomplished at mass vaccination centers across the province? Mr. Bell. And thanks once again to the member. During conversations that we had with local public health units and heads of council last week, we made it clear that we will need them every step of the way to help execute and improve on this plan. This will be a team effort that we're going to see right across the province, no matter if it's the hospitals or the public health units or even the private sector as well. 
And here's one example of one of the mass vaccination centers set up from the folks at U of T of Mississauga and what leadership they have shown. And clinics like this will play a major part in a provincial vaccination plan. Our plan is the most comprehensive vaccine distribution plan in Canada, tailored to each one of our 34 public health units. With the great news about a third vaccine now approved for use, we accept shipments will become more reliable and consistent over the coming weeks and months, and hopefully will allow us to uh, vaccinate more Ontarians within a sh much shorter period of time. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Good morning, Speaker. Um, my question is to the Premier. Yesterday, this government once again voted against giving workers in Ontario paid sick days, voting instead to continue forcing families in places like Brampton to choose between going to work and getting sick or staying home but not being able to pay the bills. Speaker, this Premier has already said that he th thinks that spending money to keep families in Brampton safe is a waste of money. Mm. Speaker, why does the Premier think that families in Brampton aren't worth investing in? Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise uh, to uh, answer this question uh, once again. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the very first piece of legislation that this legislature approved when COVID-19 hit the province of Ontario uh, was job protected leave to tell every worker in the province if they're impacted by COVID-19, if they're home in self-isolation, if they're in quarantine, if you're a mom or a dad that has to stay home and look after a son or a daughter because of the disruptions uh, to the school system, that you're not going to be fired for that. Furthermore, we eliminated the need uh, for sick notes during uh, COVID-19. But, Mr. Speaker, we negotiated uh, a $1.1 billion deal with the federal government in partnership with all provinces and territories to deliver uh, now four weeks of paid sick days for every single worker uh, in the province of Ontario. And I would implore every opposition MPP to come clean with their constituents. Let them know Response. that there's four weeks of paid sick days for every worker in Ontario. The supplementary question. Speaker, many hardworking families in Brampton are stuck between a rock and a hard place right now. Our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Lowe, has been crystal clear. Essential workers across the region of Peel are still going into work sick because they cannot afford to miss a day of work. Our Mayor has been clear. Paid sick days will save lives in our city. Speaker, families in Brampton have been on the front lines of this crisis, but years of neglect by the Liberal government in our health care system have strained our health care resources, and now large numbers of essential workers are being ignored by this Conservative government. Speaker, again to the Premier, despite what this government thinks, families in Brampton are not a waste of money. It's actually the fiscally prudent thing to do so that we aren't straining our health care resources in our city. Speaker, when is this government going to stop fighting New Democrats and finally give families in Brampton the paid sick days they need to stay safe? Members, please take your seat. Minister of Labour, to reply once again. Mr. Speaker, the opposition party uh, won't take yes for an answer. There is now four weeks of paid sick days for every worker in the province of Ontario. And, and Mr. Speaker, to quote the leader of the opposition on February 16th, she said, what we want to see is paid sick days in Ontario. Ten paid sick days, seven. Rather, ten sick days, seven paid. And yes, that would be employers' responsibility. Mr. Speaker, there's $800 million left in the bank account. There's four weeks of paid sick days for every worker in the province of Ontario. It's up to Order. every elected official to let the workers know that this program is out there for them. That's what we're doing on this side of the House. You should join us. Again, I remind members to make their comments through the chair and not directly across the floor. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, I've read the Minister's testimony before the Long-Term Care Commission, and in it she repeatedly states that she raised concerns about staff working in more than one home, asymptomatic transmission, and the need to stabilize the workforce. And clearly, given the Minister's training and experience, she knew there was a lot at stake. So last spring, BC and Quebec moved quickly to stop workers from working in more than one home and to raise their wages to stabilize the workforce. It took Ontario one month to do the same. One month 
in a pandemic. So, Speaker, through you, can the minister explain why it took so long for Ontario to take the same action as BC and Quebec? Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, you know, in hindsight, you go back and you say, what was happening? What was the historical information that was understood at that time? And many, many people were working around the clock to address these issues. If we look at long-term care homes, they were in the front lines against COVID-19, not only in Ontario, but around the world. And we were using every option at our disposal to prevent and contain the spread of this virus. We implemented surveillance testing for residents and staff. And this helped to slow the outbreaks by catching new cases early. And the Premier pushed personally, and so did I, to have every resident and staff member tested in wave one as part of our testing strategy, which is absolutely key to asymptomatic spread. Despite the reluctance of some, we pushed for implementation of rapid testing in wave two. And more than 1.5 million, uh, million rapid tests have been shipped to over 550 homes. The previous government, propped up by the opposition, had 15 years to bring about the quote-unquote revolution in long-term care. Thank you. Yeah. Order. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the Minister of Health said that the Premier blew testing wide open, which impacted long-term care, so I'd like to remind the Minister of that. And it's like we learned nothing from the first wave. So last June, Quebec said, we need to get out, we need to get 10,000 PSWs, and they went out to find them. They only got 7,000. But at the same time, homes were begging this minister for a plan. That plan came in September. And in that plan, there was $14 million to recruit and train PSWs and $42 million for security guards in long-term care. The plan didn't protect residents from the second wave. More people died in the second than the first. There was no iron ring. So, the minister announced last week the same plan, essentially the same plan that Quebec did eight months ago, eight months ago in a pandemic. It's too late, minister. Question. So, speaker, through you to the minister, why did it take your government eight months to do to announce the same staff, staffing strategy as Quebec did last June? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. You know, if the member opposite would, his, would get his facts straight, it would be much easier to have a discussion. The reality, the reality is Quebec hired orderlies. They are not PSWs. Quebec, Quebec was not able to hire 10,000, and they lost uh, uh, trainees in, through attrition who then had to pay back the government. Uh, this is not the approach that we took. We used the resources that were available to us, making sure that we we, we, Both marshaled, sides of the house come to order. we marshaled the hospital sector. We made, created matching portals, and and many of our efforts helped homes in stabilizing their their staff. And it's been neglected for many many years. And our government knows that the previous efforts by the previous government, supported by the NDP, were grossly deficient. So we're committed to increasing quality care and $1.9 billion by 24-25 uh, annually to go to supporting the, the requirement for 27,000 new positions. We've taken action all, all through this and up $115 million to help train 8,200 new personal support workers. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the uh, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, ski resorts and amusement parks are an important e economic driver in Ontario, and they play a critical role in the success of Ontario's tourism sector. These attractions employ thousands of Ontarians and contribute to Ontario being a truly four-season destination. There are also countless businesses and jobs that rely on the success of these attractions. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, ski lift and amusement device operators have been acutely impacted. Just yesterday, Speaker, I met with two ski resort York owners Center come to via order. Zoom who shared their hardships that they've experienced due to COVID. Now, ensuring that these businesses and world-class attractions they support have the support they need throughout the pandemic, that is a priority of our government. So, can the Minister of Government Question. and Consumer Services speak to the support being provided to ski lift and amusement device operators? 
Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Chatham Kent. Not only is he a very proud grandpa, but he's very proud of his riding, and I know he worked so hard because of that pride. And I'm pleased to answer his question with regards to what our government is doing to provide relief, not only for ski hills, but amusement parks across Ontario. And if we're doing this, we're facilitating this through our oversight of the Technical Standards and Safety Authority, as well as the Electrical Safety Authority as well. You know, S Speaker, on an annual basis, Fees are typically paid to TSSA for regulatory services like licenses and safety inspections under the assumption that ski hill operations would resume. But we all know that due to the pandemic, amusement parks and ski hills alike unfortunately were unable to operate through their peak season. So, Speaker, I'm very pleased that to share with you that these fees for this year Response. will be returned to them. And we're providing approximately $2 million in financial support to enable TSSA to refund the fees already paid for the 2021 season. And we're reducing ESA's oversight for the up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And thank you, Minister, for that uh, insightful response. This is very welcome news. Speaker, by providing financial support to the ski and amusement sectors, we are helping to address the financial barriers that many ski lift and amusement device operators are facing. Ensuring that these attractions are around after COVID-19 pandemic is important to enable a healthy tourism sector. The recovery of this important sector will be largely dependent on Ontario's success in combating COVID-19 pandemic. So, Therefore, Speaker, can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services explain what further supports may be available to support this very important industry? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. So, as I was mentioning earlier, we are actually looking to ESA to enable their, their recipients, their registrants, if you will, uh, additional relief by $150,000, and the Canadian Association of Amusement Operators has noted that this fee waiver will be a huge savings for the industry. And over and above that, beyond the two oversight fee waivers, supplementary transfer payment funding up to $175,000 may be available to TSSA in the fis current fiscal year on an as-needed basis to help with the provision of additional temporary relief. And you know, Speaker, it's very important to recognize that we all continue to look for ways to support our industries throughout this province. But I'd also like to take this moment to give a shout out to TSSA. They've hit a milestone. I'd like to congratulate them on the release of its new customer relationship Response. manager IT system. This is another critical step to modernizing as a regulator and moving towards a risk-based approach as technical safety and standards of our, are upheld in Ontario. Thank you very much. The next question, member for Thunder Bay, Atacocan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Thunder Bay is still in a COVID crisis. Our cases keep rising. We're in lockdown. Our hospital uh, is filling up. Finally, more resources are on the way, but this government took so long. More help is needed. For months, the opposition has proposed sensible choices like paid sick leave and capping class sizes so we can stop this lockdown cycle. Yet this government won't work with us. What is this government's plan to help Thunder Bay for the long run to make sure this doesn't happen again? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. This is an obvious concern of the, with respect to the breakouts in Thunder Bay, and that's why last week uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, working with uh, the local medical officer, decided to apply the emergency break to put Thunder Bay into gray lockdown area to prevent further transmission and to make sure that our hospitals and health care services are not being overwhelmed. 
Additional supports have been provided. There's been additional money that's been placed into the hospital to allow for more beds to be created. But it is the variants of concern that are a, a priority right now in dealing with them, trying to get them under control. We know from the modeling that's been done that the variants are going to become the dominant strain within the next several weeks. So that is something that uh, the Dr. Williams, the local medical officers of health, and the, uh, the vaccine task force, of course, is working to do vaccines Response. as quickly as possible. But we're very aware of the concerns in Thunder Bay and are sending extra help to, uh, to help the local medical officer of health deal with this outbreak. Supplementary question. Again, my uh, uh, question is for the Premier. While we're on the subject of COVID of, in Thunder Bay, I wanted to speak about providing health care at home. As we struggle with high rates of community spread in Thunder Bay, we could provide care at home instead of hospitals. This is one more way we could keep people safe. My constituent, Shauna, receives transfusions every day at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Science Centre. Shauna would greatly benefit from having her treatment in her home, but because she can take care of herself without help, transfusions at home are not funded. What will the ministry do to help as many people as possible to stay safe and receive the health care they need at home? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, the member is absolutely right that we are doing whatever we can to make sure that people can be treated at home if their uh, health condition permits it. That's why we uh, passed the Connecting People to Home and Community Care Act, which is going to modernize the delivery of home and community care by um, bringing an outdated system that was designed in the 1990s into the 21st century. There are many conditions where people can be treated at home. Dialysis is one example, overnight dialysis and others as well. But we're taking further steps to make sure that we are going to be able to allow people to stay in the comfort of their own home to uh, to uh, receive treatment either by visiting nurses or personal support workers or in some cases we're able to make sure that we can connect people to um, to a virtual assistance so that they can monitor their conditions at home without having to uh, to go either out to see their family doctor or to be admitted to a hospital so we are redesigning and modernizing the system so what you've suggested uh, can actually happen that people can be cared for in their own homes the next question the member for don valley east well thank you very much mr speaker my question is to the minister of long-term care Minister, your testimony to the Long-Term Care Commission makes it clear that while you and your deputy minister were concerned and you actually advocated for stronger and earlier restrictions in long-term care, those concerns were ultimately ignored. On June 17, 2020, the Premier told this House that the Minister of Long-Term Care had more experience than the entire opposition combined. Speaker, through you. Why does the minister believe that the premier chose not to listen to her, her deputy minister, and her, her ministry over concerns when it came to earlier restrictions and increased staffing in long-term care homes? Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, for the question. Uh, we were listening to the experts. Uh, Long-term care homes are the front line in the fight against COVID-19. And uh, certainly as a family doctor for many, many years, who started at age 14 looking after seniors, I uh, spent 46 Order. years looking after seniors uh, and advocating for them. So this is very close to my heart. We implemented surveillance testing of residents and staff. It helped slow the outbreaks. And this la layers and layers of defense while the science evolved, why the experts around the world disputed the evidence and, and went back and forth. It took months for the evidence uh, to come forward. Uh, and as a Minister of Long-Term Care, I took my responsibility, my obligation and my duty very seriously. So when Response. we go forward, we understand the importance of staffing, the importance of the, the capacity, and both these two key areas were left to languish for so many years. We're building 15,000 new beds. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. It's uh, clear that the uh, Premier was not <clears throat> listening to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, Speaker, 
The Premier told Ontario's, Ontarians that he was going to build an iron ring around long-term care homes. And on June 24, 2020, the Premier told this House that his Minister of Long-Term Care was up later than anyone else in this chamber, making sure that that iron ring around long-term care was there. But clearly, there was no iron ring. And we know, thanks to the Minister of Health, that the Premier had no problem overriding the advice of the Chief Medical Officer when it came to opening up COVID-19 testing to all Ontarians last spring. So, Speaker, through you, if the Minister doesn't believe that the Premier chose to ignore the concerns that she voiced, why did she not speak out sooner to ensure that there was, in fact, an iron ring around our long-term care homes here in Ontario? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to remind I'd like to remind the chamber that it was the premier who spent, was constantly looking for PPE, bringing manufacturing of PPP, PPE to Ontario, and it was the premier who listened to my concerns about asymptomatic spread, about issues surrounding the lack of capacity in long-term care, the lack of staffing, and is the premier who, every step of the way, made sure to advocate for more testing because that is exactly what we needed in long-term care because of asymptomatic spread. It is the Premier Order. Who, who went to bat for all the residents in long-term care, and I appreciate everything that he did for Ontarians and continues to do. We're committed to addressing the long-standing neglect by the previous government uh, for staffing, for capacity, $1.9 billion dollars annually by 2024-25. It is a Conservative government that is bringing the solutions to long-term care after decades, decades of neglect and the self-righteousness wafting from the other side. Order. Order. The next question. The member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Speaker, last week on Monday, uh, we celebrated Human Trafficking Awareness Day. We heard from the Solicitor General and this minister about the devastating impact trafficking can have on individuals and their families. It's also unimaginable that someone would do something so horrific to another person. We also heard that many victims are children and youth. Which, are potentially, which potentially robs them of their well-being and futures. This type of crime is disgusting, and it cannot be tolerated. In my writing of Chatham Kent Leamington, I've held town halls to raise awareness about this issue. I'm also proud to say that I've held three uh, public seminars. The last one had in excess of 600 people present, comprised of parents, grandparents, students, children, teachers, etc. I'm grateful to community groups in Chatham, Kent, and Leamington for their assistance. Victim Services, OPP, Chatham, Kent Police Services, Chatham, Kent Health Alliance, and of course, Question. we also heard from survivors, a real life eye opener. So, spe uh, Speaker, can the minister inform my constituents who haven't attended my town halls and other Ontarians what some of the signs of trafficking are? The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Chatham Kent Leamington for that question, and thank you for your incredible advocacy to support victims and survivors of human trafficking. And I would encourage all members of this House to host similar virtual town halls at this time. It's incredible that you had over 500 people come out. Speaker, raising awareness is the first line of defence in combating human trafficking. That is why our first pillar in our anti-human trafficking strategy is raising awareness. These signs include abuse such as bruising, cigarette burns, branding or tattoos of names or symbols, not being allowed to speak for themselves, don't have any belongings or money. For children and youth in particular, as they are being groomed, you may notice that they are withdrawing from family and friends, have a second cell phone, they're skipping school and hanging out with older groups of people, wearing new clothes or changing their appearance like hair color. Speaker, these are just some of the many signs that we all need to be aware of. Trafficking can occur anywhere and to anyone. It can be your daughter, Response. your granddaughter, your sister, your best friend at school, your neighbour, or even you. And I encourage all Ontarians to go to ontario.ca slash human trafficking to look for more signs about trafficking and where to get help. Thank you. And a supplementary question? Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Speaker, the Minister is absolutely right. Raising awareness is the first line of defence. But we cannot do that only in this House. We need to be raising awareness and informing people about trafficking across Ontario. It is imperative that more people understand that trafficking is happening. And it's also equally as important that individuals know where they can go to get help. So I thank the minister for providing that website. 
And of course, the phone number is on that website. Speaker, one thing I often hear when speaking about this issue, that, is only, that it only happens in big cities like Toronto and not in small towns or areas like mine. Mm -hmm. There are many other misconceptions about trafficking across the province. Speaker, did you know that 401, it cuts through Chatham-Kent and it's not too far from Leamington as well. Motel and hotel owners need to be more aware of what's actually going on. Speaker, clearly more needs to be done to inform the people of Ontario, including our children and youth, of what could happen. So, therefore, Question. Speaker, can the minister inform the House what she is doing and what this government is doing to raise more awareness about this issue? Thank you. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member for that question. Speaker, human trafficking can happen anywhere and to anyone, and it is not limited to big cities. That being said, children and youth are more targeted and more vulnerable, as well as Indigenous women and girls, 2S LGBTQ plus individuals, and those in the child welfare system. That is why we created programs last year to help these individuals learn about the signs for themselves and for their friends. I want to commend again the Minister of Transportation for working to raise awareness at en routes across the province. Speaker, I am also so proud of our government and the campaign we launched to raise awareness. As many in the House have seen, we have worked to create ads for children, youth and parents so they know the signs. These ads can be seen across different media platforms. And I also want to encourage everyone to go to Twitter and check out at Stop Trafficking to learn more. It's a great tool to, and full of information. Speaker, this is a crime that can quietly Response. occur and devastate lives. But if we all work together to raise awareness and inform our constituents about it, we can save lives and build better futures. Thank you. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Over the last year, small businesses have suffered like never before. They are counting on timely and reliable support from this government. That's why I'm alarmed by the number of small businesses in Parkdale High Park who have been unable to access the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. Some are waiting for a decision more than six weeks after applying, and others have been denied the grant because of a wrong assessment. Small business owners and workers cannot afford to wait. The bills are piling up. What is the Premier doing to address this? Member for Willowdale, Parliament. Well, thank Minister you very much, Dan. Speaker, and I'm glad to hear the member address the importance of uh, assisting small businesses throughout this very difficult time. Uh, Speaker, uh, I want to remind this House of just a few of the measures we've introduced from the beginning to support small businesses. We reduced property taxes up to 30 percent, a permanent measure for small businesses. The NDP voted against that. Speaker, we reduced the EHT, a tax on jobs. That means 30,000 of the smallest small businesses in this province will save on that tax. The NDP voted against that. Speaker, we invested $680 million Order. in additional investment into broadband infrastructure, bringing the total to a billion dollars. Speaker, the NDP voted against that. In fact, when it comes to actually putting action behind the word, Speaker, the NDP has a lot of ta talk, but when it comes to the action, Speaker, to support small businesses, what do we get from the NDP? Crickets. The supplementary question. Speaker, one small business owner in my riding has been waiting for weeks just to be able to make a small change to, the, to his application. Another was asked by an administrator to send documents to an email address that doesn't exist. These operational failures are unacceptable for small businesses on the brink of survival. Can the Premier ensure Order. that every small business affected by these issues will receive the Ontario Small Business Support Grant? Thank you very much, Speaker. And I, I'm very proud of this Small Business Support Grant program. In fact, over a billion dollars, a billion dollars has reached the hands of the small businesses throughout Ontario, Speaker. In fact, the average waiting time for those applicants for the Small Business Support Grant program, Speaker, is 12 days. 12 days, Speaker, and that means that people in Toronto have received over 200 million. That is real relief that businesses can put towards weathering the storm, Speaker. Now, when it comes to certain applications, the ones that are more complex or the ones that have errors will take longer, but the average time is 12 days, Speaker, and I want to encourage the member, if there are challenges with that, to contact us. We will help them through that application process to make sure that the businesses are going to get the supports they need until COVID-19 is a memory for all of us. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Parents and caregivers all over Ontario are shocked and scared by the cruelty of child isolation policies articulated by regions and school boards across the province. Peel and York regions ask parents of dismissed cohorts to keep children isolated from others, including family. Dr. Richardson, an infectious disease physician and professor emerita at the University of Toronto, called this a cruel punishment, especially for young children that could prove significant and long-lasting psychological effects. Yesterday, Associate Chief Medical Officer of Health clarified that the province would like kids to be completely isolated along with one caregiver and kept away from the rest of the family, but use common sense. What common sense, Speaker? How about single family uh, parent households or parents working shifts away from home. This government keeps inventing policies that defy human life. Public health has simply lost their mind. My question to the minister, does he, does he agree, disagree with doctors who insist that child isolation policies may amount to child neglect? Will he immediately put an end to such policies and will he apologize for the cruelty displayed by this government and Public Health question. Ontario? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, um, as the member may know, that guidance has been changed uh, by Dr. Lowe. He's not recommending complete isolation for children uh, as a result of COVID, and he has walked that back. He did actually when he attended at the um, University of Toronto, Mississauga campus. Um, uh, uh, vaccination clinic yesterday, he indicated that his uh, guidance had been misinterpreted and he clarified it. So it's not as, as terrible as the uh, member is suggesting. It's very reasonable um, considering the guidelines that we all need to follow. The supplementary question. Speaker, I have not heard a response, and in fact, the Chief uh, Medical Officer of Health clarified that it should be a separation with one caregiver, but this is a cruel and unusual policy is almost province-wide. Lambton wants children to stay in their room at all times, including meals. TDSB, Wellington County, and others have similar policies. Dr. Fulford, a pediatrics infectious disease specialist from Hamilton, doesn't understand how any healthcare professional moves so far away from doing harm, doing no harm, that they would propose to incarcerate a child in a room for 14 days. A spokesperson said the minister had absolutely nothing to do with the development or approval of these guidelines, then or now. That's the Minister of Education. So the Minister of Education is abdicating responsibility and tries to pin this debacle on public health. The government loves to say that they will always take the advice of the public health experts. The episode taught all Ontarians everything we need to know about the state of public health in the province of Ontario. My question to the Minister of Education. Given the experience of the last few days with cruelty and incompetence by public health authorities on full display, do you still believe that it's appropriate question. to always rely on the advice of the experts at Public Health Ontario? The response, Minister of Health. In fact, the, uh, the leaders at Public Health Ontario have done a tremendous job at uh, containing COVID and now setting up the vaccination clinics and giving advice with respect to uh, children. In fact, what the uh, medical officers of health have always advocated is for a quick return for children to school. That is one of the most important things that we can do for the child. Come to order and allow the minister to reply. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the mental health and physical health of children is one of the most important things that we need to protect during this crisis, and our public health units have done a tremendous job of doing that and bringing forward very sensible recommendations for us. But the return to school is something that we brought back as forward, uh, forward as quickly as possible because we know that is vital for the mental and physical health, and we know that mental health is going to be very challenged as a result of this. Even after everyone has been vaccinated, the mental health concerns will persist, and Bonds? we are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into helping children and young people with their mental health concerns. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Ontario, the Ontario Tourism Ministry is suffering. They are angry and they are crying out for help. In my writing of Algoma, Manitoulin, many outfitters face circumstances similar to those of Michelle and Tom Watson at KB Lodge who lost over 90% of their clientele due to the border restrictions. Accumulating growing debt month after month is not an option for these tourist outfitters or many others within the tourism sector. Premier, the bleeding continues while this government stands idly by. Businesses are dying, and so is Ontario's tourism. Will this government step up and expand emergency programs to finally ensure that all Ontario tourism-based businesses are included? Member for Willowdale. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. And of course, we recognize on the government benches, and we have from the beginning of this pandemic, that the tourism sector has been severely impacted by COVID-19. And that's why we've outlined a series of small business measures throughout this pandemic from the beginning of since March of 2020, supporting these businesses, not just today, but allowing for permanent tax reductions, whether it was the EHT, the tax on jobs, or property taxes for these operators, so they can not only weather this storm today, but be prosperous once again tomorrow. Speaker, I'm glad to hear that the members opposite are finally talking about small business supports. They voted against it all year last year. They voted Order. against it in the budget this time around and recognizing that more needs to be done. Order. I hope that when we table our budget this year, the NDP will support the, me the measures we're going to have to continue to support the tour operators here in the great province of Ontario. The supplementary question. Speaker, here's a few more proposals to help this government and the tourism-based businesses across this province. Immediate grants that have greater eligibility because too many businesses simply don't qualify for help as the current criteria and funding is far too limited. New Democrats propose a series of measures through the Save Main Street plan to help small businesses keep their head above water. Will this government take the measures I just mentioned, expand the eligibility of the Ontario Small Business Support Grant today, and actually ensure that our tourism industry survives this unprecedented crisis? Member from uh, thank you very much, and, and uh, I want to let the House know that over almost 80,000 uh, successful applications uh, have been granted in the province, and that means that uh, $1.1 billion has been uh, flowed to these businesses who need uh, help right now, recognizing, of course, that the tourism sector has been hit very hard, Speaker. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been allocated to support uh, this ministry. More, of course, needs to be done. More will be done to support these uh, hardworking businesses, and we look forward to working with the members opposite for that recovery path. We're hoping this time around that the members will actually support and vote in favour of those measures that support small businesses, instead of standing in this House Response? every day and rejecting, through action, the support measures that we put in place. We look forward to that collaboration, and I'm encouraged to hear the member opposite uh, indicate that here in the legislature today. Very much. Member for Scarborough, Fieldwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In a few weeks, the temporary residential evictions moratorium, the Canada emergency wage subsidy, and the Canada emergency rent subsidy are scheduled to end. While the federal government has indeed stepped up to help Ontarians weather this pandemic, the provincial government continues to hoard $4 billion in standard contingency funds, with just four weeks left in the fiscal year. Individuals and businesses throughout the province are making sacrifices based on the understanding that we need to support each other and to get through this pandemic. We are only beginning the process of vaccinating all Ontarians, and we still face the threat of COVID variants. Speaker, small businesses in Scarborough and on main streets across Ontario need certainty. Speaker, does the Premier intend to extend the moratorium on evictions Question. until we have everyone in this province vaccinated and we can truly open the economy and get people back to work? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the the, uh, the many questions uh, within that. Uh, within that, uh, look, uh, was, as we said right from the beginning, and as the Premier has been uh, uh, very vocal upon, uh, when we started out with this pandemic, a, uh, a certain commitment was made between the government, the federal government, and the provincial governments. The, the, the federal government would uh, handle uh, transfers to individuals and uh, and people. Order. Uh, and that allowing us to pour billions of dollars into health and long-term care, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that is uh, a commitment that has worked well. That is why we have been saying right from the beginning that we need to have cooperation, not only with our federal partners, but with our municipal partners. Of course, it's been enunciated by the Minister of Labour with a one point, uh, over $1 billion plan for uh, uh, for sick uh, for sick pay. So we will continue to advocate uh, uh, for the people of the province of Ontario to continue to have the resources that we need for health and long-term care for education. We uh, are, uh, of course, continuing to encourage the federal government uh, to continue with programs uh, that help individuals uh, as well as those that we are. The supplementary question. Speaker, this government continuing to hoard billions of dollars in contingency funds is not working well for everyday Ontarians. Speaker, we have seen from the FAO's labour report and from Stats Canada that tourism 
restaurants, hospitality and service sectors have been the hardest hit by COVID-19. It is also understood that these sectors will be the last to recover once the pandemic is over. Last week, the City of Toronto announced it has cancelled all outdoor events up to and including Canada Day celebrations. Across the province, expectations have been already drastically reduced for 2021. An example of this can be seen in Stratford, where the Stratford Festival announced its season will be merely 5% of normal year's attendance. With more events cancelled or scaled back, the spin-off jobs will, Question. will not come back either. We see a youth unemployment rate of 22 per cent. So is this government in its upcoming budget investing in skills de development for job-seeking Ontarians? Yeah. 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 Member for Willowdale. Well, thank you, Speaker. And there's a lot to unpack in that, that answer there. More supports will be outlined for small businesses. I look forward to tabling that budget later this month. But, Speaker, the member opposite continues to mention uh, contingency funds. And, you know, I guess the member thinks that if she repeats the same claim again and again, that somehow it'll become true. But, Speaker, the reality is that every dollar of the historic $13.5 billion contingency set aside to support and protect the lives and livelihoods of the people we serve has been used, Speaker. Hard stop. And I know the Liberals are stuck playing partisan games and referencing numbers from the second quarter of last year. Order. But, Speaker, our government is planning for today, preparing for the future during this very uncertain time. So, if the Liberals can't join us and at Order. least planning for that future, please join us in the here and now. Please join us at least in 2021. Next question, member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, a school in Scarborough is closed today due to an outbreak of COVID-19 where at least four people have tested positive for a variant of concern. As of this morning, COVID-19 cases have now been reported in over 13 per cent of Ontario schools, with 23 schools closed due to outbreaks, 262 new school cases. What's just as concerning is the number of asymptomatic cases that we do not know about. A month ago, the minister finally announced support for asymptomatic testing for schools, promising a program that would ramp up to 50,000 asymptomatic tests a week. Where are they? Where are they, Mr. Speaker? As of Friday, only 2,853 tests have been conducted province-wide in the last seven days. Question. This minister knew Last summer, his own officials were saying, get an asymptomatic broad testing program in place. He refused. When will the minister pick up the pace? Minister of Education. Well, I appreciate the constructive thoughts from the member opposite, as always. I want to, um, I want to just note, Speaker, some data points, because obviously uh, the member opposite has not checked the web, where we uh, actually post our asymptomatic data po uh, since we started uh, all province-wide this uh, winter, and as we started posting transparently the number of cases, outbreaks, and school closures since last September, one of the few provinces that did that at the beginning. In York Region, we have 18 more schools identified for asymptomatic testing, 31 in Hamilton, 75 in the member city of Toronto, 24 in Ottawa, 11 in Waterloo. The list continues. Let me edify the member on the results so far. In Peel, of the 118 tests conducted in the past days, zero cases were identified. In Hamilton, Catholic, where 114 tests were completed, zero cases were identified. In Hamilton-Wentworth, where 142 cases were uh, tests were completed, zero cases were identified. Response. Mr. Speaker, there is about roughly 99.5 percent of schools that are currently open in the province of Ontario. 99.52 percent are open. 86.7 percent of schools have no active case reported at all. We're going to continue to invest to keep our schools safe. Thank you. That concludes question period this morning. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 101C, a change has been made in the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Ms. Burns McGowan assumes ballot item number 60 and Mr. Glover assumes ballot item number 75. We now have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 245, an act to amend and repeal various statutes, to revoke various regulations, and to enact the Ontario Land Tribunal Act 2021. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the logs.